The Winds of Fortune, Leathaven, where Brokeliand is stirring, Leathaven is becoming quiescent. Following a period of unexpectedly high activity that saw Marcha and Navarre armies fighting to keep the Volon contained, the malignant threat at the heart of the Leathaven seems to be sliding deeper into slumber. One reason for this relative lack of activity is the casting of a potent curse. During the summer solstice 382 YE, the voice of the quiet forest worked the ritual wither the seed on Leathaven. For the next 30 years, the life of Leathaven will be stifled, and that includes the unnatural vitality of the Valorn. It will take potent magic indeed to rouse it while the 30-year winter lies across Leathaven. The Leathaven Valorn is weak. Its recent attempt at expansion has depleted its strength and the winter magic that now smothers that territory makes it more difficult for it to replenish that strength. The Vates had already identified an opportunity to strike against the Valorn in the Westwood, potentially driving it out and leaving it in possession only of Liath's heart. The Valorn is a thing of unfettered fecundity, however, and that window of opportunity is closing. By the start of the summer solstice 383, the energies of the Valorn will be once again strong enough to resist attempts to clear them with martial force, and the opportunity to do so again is unlikely to come any time soon. Fortunately, the Empire controls a beachhead in Leathaven. If they had not secured West Ranging from the Yotun, the challenge of fighting the Valorn would be dramatically more difficult. Even so, claiming the Westwood from its clutches will require significant effort. They have only six months to do so, and would need to claim the entire region of Westwood before the start of the summer solstice. If even a tenth of the region is still controlled by the Valorn when the solstice dawns, it will slowly expand back to its full strength. It would be possible to delay that expansion, perhaps with similar techniques to those used in Brokeliand, but it would not be possible to prevent it reclaiming its lost area. Claiming Westward will require the Empire to overcome the effective strength of the Valorn and generate sufficient victory points to claim the entire region before the start of the summer solstice. Determining how much resistance the Empire would face will require the use of magical scrying. Eyes of the Sun and Moon should be sufficient to estimate the effective strength of the Valorn in Westward. The simplest way to reclaim the region would be to bring to bear sufficient force to overcome the Valorn and generate a further 10 victory points in a single season. But that is no trivial matter. It is not possible for military units alone to achieve this task. Clearing Westwood is a matter for Imperial armies. The general of any army that moves to Leathaven will need to take an attacking order and make clear that they are seeking to clear the Westwood. Leathaven is still divided. In the unlikely event that an army is only able to reach the southern side of the territory, they will be unable to take advantage of the beachhead in West Ranging, and their ability to contribute to the campaign will be affected accordingly. The fighting will be taking place in a region infused with the Valorn Miasma. As a consequence, any casualties suffered by the army will be doubled. While there is a new ritual in Imperial law that might help mitigate the effects of the Miasma, which is why Sulemane walked away from the baker. Even that powerful enchantment cannot entirely remove the sting of the Valorn's choking atmosphere. Numbers of casualties could be mitigated by army orders as normal, but many orders that reduce casualties also reduce the number of victory points generated. Furthermore, any military unit that is assigned to assist the battle in Brokeliand likewise risks suffering serious casualties. All military units assigned to the campaign will suffer a reduction of 40 to their effective fighting strength for the next six months. This represents soldiers lost or crippled in the Volor Miasma. And finally, while it will be possible to inflict casualties on Volorn forces, which may serve to somewhat weaken them in the second season, the irrepressible nature of the Volorn means that they will be completely restored at the start of the summer solstice. When the Quiet Step, the Tusks and the Bounders fought the expansion of the Valorn in Leathaven in Spring 382, 
the Navarre army was infused with an enchantment of devastating fire. The winter magic, which was drawn from the burnt prince of the thrice-cursed court, devoured Valonsborn and consumed Spring Regios with equal ferocity. During the summer solstice, Surat sent one of his barons to negotiate further aid. The Navarre politely refused the offer, and Surat's emissary returned empty-handed. Shortly before the winter solstice, the Baron of the Bone Orchard visits the Empire once again at the command of his charred master. The Knight of Ashes is not entirely pleased with the Empire. After accepting his offer of aid for the Navarre with amnity during the spring equinox and acquiring the boon as payment, they then remove that amity almost immediately afterwards. Still, Surat is not one to bear a grudge, or so claims the Baron of the Bone Orchard. He will, of course, honour the boon that he gave to the Navarre. But if the Empire desires further aid, they're going to need to pay in advance. The Imperial Conclave grants amnity to Surat again during the winter solstice, and he will prepare significant boons to aid the Navarre in an assault against Leatherven to be delivered at the start of the spring equinox. In return, however, Surat will consume one of the forests of either Birchland, Towermarch, or Aldley to sate his hunger. The Winter Archmage is free to use their power of plenipotentiary to suggest which forests they would prefer Surut to devour, and if they choose to do so and request parley, then Surut will prepare additional boons that will offer assistance to the Empire in dealing with their enemies in the West, or the Empire could continue to spurn his aid, whichever they wish. Shortly after the summer solstice, the forest of Leathaven was severed from the network of trods that crisscrosses the Empire by unknown magic. As it's not Imperial territory, it's extremely difficult to restore these trods. Indeed, due to the limitations of the ritual, a band of magicians would need to find a powerful spring regio in either Westwood or Leath's heart to restore that connection, and doing so is no trivial proposition. On the Fenny. The Fenny of the Woods that Fell tribe are foreigners. One group has left the Mornworld and consequently disappeared into Leathaven. The other group have left the Harnmark and entered Hassinia. And some survivors of the Fenny of Alderley have also entered Leathaven. The southern branch of the Woods that Fell, after several months of disruption in the marches, have left the Mornworld and passed into Leathaven's Glen. They are followed a few weeks later by what appears to be the survivors of the Imperial attack on the Fenny camp in the depths of the Alderley. Both groups have passed beyond the ken of the Navarre. The Avans Glen is, after all, still technically in the hands of the Yotun, and the Navarre presence in Leathaven has been significantly depleted in recent years. The Fenny of the woods that fell and the refugees from Alderley represent separate tribes. It is difficult to be sure whether they will prove to be allies or fight bitterly, or simply ignore one another. Regardless, the treaty prepared by Imperial Consul Skywise Fal and ratified by the Senate gives approval for the Fenny to live in eastern Leathaven for the next 30 years, as long as they refrain from raiding into the Empire, and provisions are made for them to request assistance rather than to take it by force. They will be left in peace by Imperial citizens. Only half of the tribe of the woods that fell went south when their home fell into Lorenzo's deep pockets. The other half travelled north into Harnmark, where their raids brought disruption to the halls of Wintermark. They spent some time in southern Southridge, and when they moved again, their numbers had been bolstered by Fenny from the other tribes that dwell in the gullies and the woodlands of the Harnmark. Despite some attempt by a peaceful Suak Krimnir, named Kokana Brokenwing to find a peaceful solution, no resolution was achieved by the end of the autumn equinox. Over the next few months, the nomadic Fenny crossed the border out of Harnmark into Old Ranging in Hersinia, making them now a Navarre problem. The Fenny have spread out a little as they travel through Old Ranging, but their warbands maintain a high degree of communication with one another. The steadings of southern Hersinia are prosperous, largely unprepared for the raids of these green and yellow invaders. Old Ranging is also an important trade route. With Kalperheim at one end, Gildenheim at the other, 
Merchants travelling the trods are in immediate danger of being attacked and robbed by these bandits. While comparatively minor, these raids range as far east as Somersend and have knock-on effects for people living across the territory. Interestingly, whilst the Fenny are primarily interested in food and resources, they also seem to be making a point to raid manor sites, rather than the herb gardens that they've done previously. It's unclear why they're suddenly so interested in Crystal Manor. Furthermore, their advance northward seems to have slowed down. There's no indication that they're interested in moving en masse into Somersend, or perhaps unsurprisingly, to risk the Valorn at Deer's folly. If the Fenny are still in Hercinia at the end of the winter solstice, and every indication is that they will be, every farm and business in Hercinia will suffer a 36 ring penalty to their production and each manor site will produce one fewer crystal manor. The Senate has declared that the Fenny of the Woods that fell to be foreigners, but those in the North continue to act like bandits. While the Fenny bands in Hercinia are a nuisance, neither group represents a significant military threat. For all their woodcraft, the Fenny are moving through unfamiliar territory, and they are vulnerable to a decisive strike from an imperial army. A single campaign army in Hercinia, whose general explicitly includes instructions to destroy the Fenny of the Woods that fell in their orders, would easily break them. Imperial prognosticators have calculated that the army doing so would suffer no more than 50 casualties, dependent on the nature of the orders given. The Fenny band would be wiped out, and any that survived would be forced to scatter and flee, and the threat of any raids would end immediately. Of course, it would not be legal to do that whilst the Fenny are foreigners. It's true that many of their numbers are engaging in raiding, but there are some who are not. Any general considering taking the fight to the Fenny would do well to consult with head magistrate Stanislav Karkovich. But what the Senate has granted, it could revoke were it minded to do so. If the Imperatrix or the Senate declared these Fenny and Hercinia to be barbarians, then they could be wiped out without any legal complications at all, and without changing the status of the woods that fell in Leathervan. As before, there is absolutely no need to resolve the matter in this way, but the Fenny of the Northern Band have shown much less interest in negotiating directly with the Empire than the Southern Contingent. Imperial forces are rather stretched at the moment, but there should be little doubt that the Empire could swiftly neutralise any Fenny threat if they were so inclined.